you can't get any better if you don't know how you're doing. So you must constantly be getting feedback of some kind. It may come from a coach, it may come from video, but you got to know how you're doing or you can't get any better. Why can some people do things so much better than others? Now, there's a question that us humans have been wondering about for a very long time. And many of us believe that it is due to extraordinary amounts of innate talent that nature ultimately dictates who can do what and how well they can do it. That nature bestows ability that our strengths and our weaknesses are more or less immutable, hardwired at birth qualities. And the reason that some of us, very few of us are able to rise to the top of any field or any endeavor is mostly thanks to our genes. On the other hand, many people say that talent has very little to do with it or, or has nothing to do with it. And that outstanding abilities can be mostly or even wholly explained by just hard work and hashtag dedication, which anyone has the capacity for. Whether or not they do it is up to them, but anyone can do it if they can push themselves. Now, this is a rather confusing and muddled topic for good reason. We've probably known people who have gotten very good at things without appearing to ever really work hard at it, as well as people who initially displayed absolutely no aptitude for something, work tirelessly at it for many years without really ever becoming excellent. So what's the story? What does this mean? Does it mean that luck and randomness are really just the, the best predictors of success in any area of life? There are people that try to argue that as well. And according to my guest on today's episode, Jeff Colvin, both talent and hard work don't greatly correlate with top tier abilities, meaning that just being a little bit better than everyone else at something in the beginning or just working really hard at something doesn't really predict how well you're going to do in the long run and how far you are going to go with it. A very specific kind of work does though, and it's called deliberate practice. People who do a lot of deliberate practice tend to get very, very good at things and rise to the top of their respective fields. And the reason why I wanted to get Jeff on the show to talk about this is he wrote a book on it called Talent is Overrated that I read a while ago, really liked, and have recommended ever since. And in that book, Jeff explores really every angle of this conundrum. And he provides interesting stories, scientific research, as well as his own personal experiences, and makes a compelling case for what it really takes to go from bad to good to great. And in this episode, Jeff and I break this down. We discuss many different things, including why talent is often an illusion, why what many people think is talent is really not, why deliberate practice works so well and what it is, what it isn't, and how you can incorporate it into your life profitably, why the now infamous 10,000 hour rule is misleading, and more. This is where I would normally plug a sponsor to pay the bills, but I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in. So instead, I'm just going to quickly tell you about something of mine. Specifically, my 100% natural greens supplement, Genesis. Now, Genesis is a very unique combination of greens, superfoods, adaptogens, herbs, and other phytonutrients that have been proven to increase immunity, heart and circulatory health, energy levels, libido, mood, and more. Genesis is also naturally sweetened in flavors and contains no artificial food dyes, fillers, or other unnecessary junk. And all that is why it has over 200 reviews on Amazon with a four star average and another 150 plus on my website also with a four star average. So if you wanna be healthier, feel better, train harder, and increase your immunity and longevity, then you want to head over to www.legionathletics.com and pick up a bottle of Genesis today. And just to show how much I appreciate my podcast peeps, use the coupon code podcast at checkout and you will save 10% on your entire order. 
And lastly, you should also know that I have a very simple 100% money back guarantee that works like this. You either love my stuff or you get your money back, period. You don't have to return the products. You don't have to fill out forms. You don't have to jump through any other hoops or go through any other shenanigans. So you really can't lose here. Head over to www.legionathletics.com now, place your order and see for yourself why my supplements have thousands of rave reviews all over the internet. And if for whatever reason, they're just not for you, contact us and we will give you a full refund on the spot. All righty, that is enough shameless plugging for now at least. Let's get to the show. Hey Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Mike, it is my pleasure. All right. So I'm excited to talk to you because this is uh, a subject that I've read a fair amount of and I just find it very interesting myself. There are many different ways the discussion can go and I'm kind of curious uh, where you want to take it specifically. But I think where we can start is with the common belief that people that are very good at things, whether it's you know a professional sports player or a professional anything really, got their mostly because they were just talented. And if you don't have a natural talent, if you don't have a really strong knack for something that you probably will never be able to become, uh, you don't have to necessarily say professional, but or, or if we're talking about sports, you know, you're not necessarily going to become all oh, the best in the world, but you can't really become top tier at something. Yeah. I think that's a good place to start. And I'm just going to kind of pass that football to you. Yeah. <laughs> what does the research actually have to say though? What's the, what's reality? Right. Right. And it, you're right. It's a great place to start because it is absolutely what people believe. It is what almost everyone believes. And in fact, when I talk to people about this, I ask them at the very beginning, look into yourself and ask yourself, what do you really think about why the greatest performers in any realm you look at, and most definitely including athletics, what do you really think? about why they are as great as they are. What's deep, all of us I have learned from talking, from my research in this field and from talking to so many people, we all carry around with us some really deeply held beliefs about this question. So I always say, what do you really think? And the answer is that most of us, virtually all of us, really believe that the greatest performers, the incredibly, awesomely great performers, did come into this world with a natural gift. They were born with a special ability to do whatever it is that they actually do so well. And so that's the right place to start because it's what we all think most deeply. And it's also very logical in a way. It's very logical that we think that. Because when you look at the very greatest performers, you know, whether you were looking at Tom Brady in the Super Bowl, once again, he didn't win it this time, but my gosh, you know, you're not supposed to be able to do what he does at that age in the NFL. Or if you think about, if you watch golf, you know, Jordan Spieth, and if you think about Tiger when he was uh, at the top of his game, it all seems superhuman. You think that there is no way any normal human being could do what they do. So, of course, you think that they came into the world with this special gift. It seems to be the only possible explanation for their superhuman performance. So, yeah, that, that's what everybody thinks. And the research on this tells a different story. I want to emphasize that what I'm talking about here is not my own personal beliefs. I'm not spouting off my own opinions about this stuff. There is, at this point, 40 years of good research into this question of where great performance really, really comes from. And the answer is very clear. The reason this book is called Talent is Overrated is that the researchers have concluded talent, meaning this inborn gift, is not nearly as important as we all think it is. And some of the researchers actually say that talent in the sense of an inborn gift doesn't even exist. Talent in the form of an inborn ability to do something fairly specific, whether it's play tennis or play baseball or kick a soccer ball or anything like that, talent in that sense, they say, may not exist at all. 
What are, what are your thoughts on that? Because because you seem to, I mean, you see Tiger Woods, for example, with a better golf swing at three years old than most <laughs> grown people that play the game. And that, of course, has to make you wonder, like this little kid was, and he was just built to become Tiger Woods, right? Why? How, how is that even possible? Right. By the way, this comes up a lot because Tiger Woods is one of everybody's favorite counter examples to the case that I present. You know, they say, how on earth can you account for that? Well, the reality is that Tiger Woods did come into this world with an extraordinary gift, and that gift was his father, Earl Woods. He was born into a very unusual situation. His father, Earl Woods, had been married earlier and gotten divorced, and so he was now sort of on his second family, and Tiger was his only child. Uh, Earl Woods was a scratch golfer, handicap of zero. He was an excellent, excellent golfer. And he had spent much of his career teaching young men. He was uh, uh, in the Army, and he was a coach earlier in his career. He was an expert at teaching young men. And then perhaps more important than anything else, he had decided when Tiger was born, that he was going to make Tiger the greatest golfer in the world. He put a club into Tiger's hands before Tiger was one year old. <laughs> he, he figured out ways how to teach a little kid how to do a golf stroke before the kid was old enough to talk. He put Tiger in a high chair and set it up in the garage where Earl Woods had a practice tee set up so that he could hit golf balls into a, uh, a big sheet there that would stop the golf ball. As I said, he was an excellent golfer. So he would sit Tiger there, just let him watch as he, Earl, hit shots. And it was an excellent thing. And as Earl himself said later, this was like a, a movie being played over and over and over in front of Tiger's eyes, how to hit a golf ball. Well, that's the beginning of the story, and there's much more detail, but the bottom line is- that, And that's everything you don't know. You don't, you don't see that. You don't hear about that. All you see is, I think, what was it, Johnny Carson or something? You just see that famous footage of Tiger at three or four, and you're just like, what? And, but you don't see the, all this that you're talking about, where, you know, and, and considering that that's what sons do. I mean, that's what little kids do. They just look around. They mimic their parents. So if this is, if 80% of Tiger's time from the beginning to three or four years old was spent watching his dad swing a golf club and practice swinging a golf club, that starts to make sense. Absolutely. As I said, this was their only child. And he and his wife agreed that this was their project. This was their project in life, making Tiger the best golfer in the world. And so his father was a great teacher, but only taught him up until the age of five or so, at which point he engaged professional teachers to start teaching him. So the point here is, sure, it's amazing what Tiger did, but it could have been somebody else. It could have been somebody else. I always tell people the reason you're never going to be Tiger Woods is that your father wasn't Earl Woods. That's the real explanation. Now, there's an important point to be made here, which has to do with athletics uh, more than anything else, which is the obvious point that in athletics, physical dimensions play an incredibly important role. And your physical dimensions are in large part, not entirely, but in large part determined at birth by what the genes you've inherited. And you can't do anything about that, right? So if you're seven feet tall, you're never going to be an Olympic gymnast. If you're five feet tall, you're never going to be an Olympic volleyball player. And no amount of practice can change that. You know, that, that's important. But Within those bounds, within those constraints that we all face because of our size or our body shape, what this research says is the world is open to us, right? Because what makes us great is the way we prepare. And I haven't even really gotten into the specifics of that, uh, the type of preparation that the researchers have identified and described, which they call deliberate practice. But that's what it's all about. Absolutely. And I think that's the next thing worth diving into because it's not just as simple as, you know, hey, if you just work hard enough, you'll be successful at anything, whether it's business or golf or whatever, because, you know, there are plenty of people out there that work hard in terms of 
you know, they put in a lot of time and they put in a lot of effort, but they don't have much success to show for it. I mean, I myself am a golfer. I've seen that a lot on the golf course. I've seen that a lot on the driving <laughs> range. I see guys out there. I mean, when I was really working on building a swing, I'd be out there for five hours working on camera, doing stuff. And I'd see guys out there with me five hours, just slamming away at balls, swearing. Right. And, and so plenty of hard work out there. It doesn't necessarily correlate to success though, right? Because uh, this, this is where this deliberate practice concept comes in and it applies to more than just athletics. You're, you're so right. Uh, yes, this is, this is where it comes in. And, and uh, yes, I'm a lifelong golfer also. And we've all, we all understand this, uh, you know, at a really deep level. Yes, deliberate practice is not just practice. It is not what most people do when they think they're practicing. And that fact explains why most of them never get any better, um, even though they think they're practicing a lot. So let, let me say what deliberate practice is, because it's fairly specific. It's not complicated, but it's fairly specific. And this is what makes all the difference. First of all, it is neither work nor play. It is not actually performing uh, at whatever it is you're doing. At the same time, it's not just play. It's not something that is inherently enjoyable in itself. It is designed, it's an activity that is designed explicitly for you at this point in your development. And what that means is you're going to get better if you continue doing this. And as you continue getting better, your practice is going to have to change because you're a different person. Then the real heart of it is. It is designed to push you just beyond your current ability. It doesn't try to push you way beyond your current level of ability because then you'll just be lost. You won't have any idea what to do. And it doesn't allow you to operate within your current level of ability because then you won't grow at all. So it is constantly pushing you just beyond your current level of ability. It can be repeated at high volume. This turns out to be really important. And when the researchers first identified this, that it was repeated at high volume, they didn't even know yet the brain science that would later support this. It turns out that if you do certain things at very high volume, it actually builds up connections in your brain. And if you're really, really deeply into this, including the athletics of it, you may know a term called myelin, which is a substance in your brain that gets built up by high repetition practice. And in fact, some of the coaches now talk about that substance a lot. Anyway, it can be repeated at high volume. And final element, you get constant feedback. You can't get any better if you don't know how you're doing. So you must constantly be getting feedback of some kind. It may come from a coach. It may come from video. But you got to know how you're doing or you can't get any better. So that's it. Those are the elements of deliberate practice. Do you have some real world examples? Like, uh, okay, my, well, my example of that in my experience with that actually. So when I started, I played a little bit of golf growing up. I never, I never got good. And I actually probably, it probably worked against me because I kind of just ingrained bad habits more than anything else. So then when I, when I got back into it and I wanted to get good and by my estimation, so I wanted, I wanted to be able to shoot in the seventies regularly. And what's the fastest I wanted to also get there as quickly as possible and within the constraints of of my life. I can't just be on the golf course every day. And so I concluded, um, I read a book called Every Shot Counts, which I'm sure you've read if you're into golf and into reading. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. So if I want to get that good, then I need a long game first and foremost. It doesn't matter how good my short game is. If I want to play golf, real golf from the back tees, long courses, I better have a long game or I'm just never going to get there. It's not very fun to play that scramble golf, at least in my opinion. You don't really feel like you're playing a sport. So I was like, okay, so the first thing you do is build a swing. What's the most efficient way to build a swing? Then I studied a bit about the swing mechanics. I found a book. Finally, there was one book. I read quite a few I didn't like. And I found one book. It was like Decoding the Swing Plane. It was just a random, it might even been a self-published book on Amazon, but it was actually very good in explaining the mechanical aspects of the swing and and breaking it down in a way that I could really, really understand what each part of my body is supposed to do to produce, you know, a what is now kind of the, the modern 
golf swing, which you see with a lot of younger players on tour, the swings are getting more and more homogenous. It's you don't see very many erratic swings anymore or unusual looking swings. And so I practiced, I broke it down into different where it's like practicing the takeaway and practicing each kind of phase of the swing and doing it on camera. And so that was kind of the feedback and uh, the, the pushing myself was to, I was kind of modeling my swing off of, I'm trying to remember Adam Smith because his just, he has, has a very technically sound swing and there were, yeah, I had three or four models. So I was kind of working off of that. Everyone, obviously their swings are a little bit different, but I wanted somebody that you know, I, I picked people that again were about as technically sound as you can be and uh and then working on camera just comparing so i would do you know five takeaways and then i would go to them to my i use my ipad and i'd look at my takeaways and see what i was you know where was i was i getting the club head into the right position blah 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 and i would just practice that until i got it okay and then i would practice from there getting up into you know they're just kind of getting up into the to the top of the swing and then I'd put them together and then just repeating that and then, then practice the transition, which was incredibly difficult to get. I was amazed just because previously I was so over the top with my swing that that was the hardest thing actually to finally put it all together. But I went through that process working on camera the entire time and also getting feedback from, I, I did some lessons with the local pro and some other people just to make sure that I was on the right track basically. And in the end, I'd say I probably did that for about 500 hours and I went from like a pretty shitty looking swing to um, a very, I mean, uh, people would come up to me on the range and ask if I'm the pro at the club and stuff. Not not that I was, I didn't get good enough because I, I wasn't playing much golf then, but on the range, I looked really good. <laughs> and so that that's that's my experience with it. And it worked incredibly well. Uh, yeah. You were following the rules. You, you, you were following the procedure and it was hard work, undoubtedly clearly was. And you put in a lot of hours doing it. I mean, if you did 500 hours, that's a lot. You know, there are an awful lot of golfers out there who play the game and, you know, they can get around the course who have put in maybe 50 hours. They're not very good golfers, but they can get around and then, you know, they'll be okay. So you you put in a lot of hours and it paid off. You know, th this is the great story. And by the way, it illustrates another important point, uh, which is great performance is available to far more of us than we think, but it's not free. I'm not giving anything away here, right? It, it's hard. It's hard work. And no one should say otherwise. But the great news is that it's available, right? You, you, and I, I don't mean necessarily you specifically, although you specifically, but everybody else who's listening, you can be much, much better than you think you can be. It is available to you if you follow the procedure. I totally agree. And, you know, it applies again, not just to athletic things, but I think it, I mean, you, could, you could really work it out for anything. I've experienced very much the same type of thing in my work. I do a lot of writing in my work. You're a writer. You're, you, you've you probably went through that process as well. And, you know, I go and read stuff I wrote when I started and it's terrible. I'm like, I actually wrote this. This is awful. <laughs> this is really bad, actually. So I don't, I don't think I had any great talent for writing in, when, when I started. Uh, other than I was just willing to go through the process. And for the listeners, any anything that any skill that you want to acquire or anything that you want to get good at, you can absolutely do it, but you have to go about it in the right way. And I think something you said, Jeff, is uh, is probably worth you just talking a bit more about. And that is, is the process, is focusing on the process. Because it's easy to just say you want things. I, you know, I, it's easy to say, you know, for, let's just go back to my example. I want to I want to be a very good golfer. I want to shoot in the 70s. Yeah, anybody can say that, right? And, or even just more broad kind of goals that people have. They want to become so good at something that has commercial value that they can make a lot of money. Or they want to get so good at at exercise that you know they achieve certain strength goals or something like that because a lot of weightlifting is is very similar in that it's a technical activity it's not just brute muscle strength especially with certain you know with certain exercises like a squat for example it's a technical movement and it and it takes practice it takes repetitions it takes deliberate practice to get better at the squat 
as well as just getting stronger. So it's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to go, yeah, it's the wrong question. It's not what do I want? It's it's more like what kind of pain do I want? <laughs> what kind of process do I want? And what am I willing to go through? And again, in my case, I kind of tuned into this kind of stuff. So when I approached golf, I more looked at it like that. Yes, for me to play golf, it was kind of like working it backwards. For me to play golf, what would I, how good would I have to be for me to enjoy it? Cause I don't like doing things that I suck at. I just don't like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get good. or I'm just not going to do it at all. And then, okay, this is where I want to be. What is it going to take to get there? Not totally sure, but I think it's going to start with probably hundreds of hours on a driving range, building a swing. You know what I mean? So I think I'd be curious as to your thoughts and just, just more about that in terms of process versus goals. Yeah. Uh, that's a, it's a really good point because the process is clear. In a way, you could say this is simple. All you have to do is follow it. But you have to understand it's a long process and it's a hard process. So your goals become really important. How much do you want this? How much do you want it? How much are you willing to give? And one of the points that's important in this book is the idea that if becoming really great were simple, then everybody would do it. And so, you know, it wouldn't distinguish the great performers from the rest. It's not simple. It's hard. But we know how it's done. And so the question is, be clear. What do you want? And by the way, this comes up a lot because when I really get into discussions with people about this, eventually you get to this really deep question because you say, okay, becoming world-class great, we actually know how it's done. We know what it takes. And then people say, okay, I can see what it takes. It takes a lot. Do I really want to do that? Do I really want to give what it takes to become world-class great at whatever it is? And I always encourage people to ask that question and to answer it honestly for themselves. Don't fool anybody. You're not fool they're, they're, Nobody cares what the answer is except you yourself. So be honest with yourself and think about how good you want to get and how much you're willing to give. Speaking of Tom Brady, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Facebook had that, um, I, I've only, I saw the first episode, Tom versus time. Uh, one thing that he said in it's uh, just, I liked kind of resonating with me where he made the point of, you know, for 18 years, he's given everything to football. He's given his entire life to football. This is him speaking, saying, hey, if you want to compete with me, then you better be willing to give up your life because that's what I've done. I've given up everything. That's a great quote. That's a great quote because that really says it. What I stress to people is any answer is okay. If you decide that you don't want to go all the way down that road, that you're not willing to give your life for 18 years and counting in his case, that's okay. You just need to be honest. There's a story in the book about a chess player. It's actually an incredible play, uh, story about three sisters in, from Hungary who were trained from birth exactly according to the principles of deliberate practice at being chess players. And they became the three best chess players in Hungary. They became the three best women chess players in the world. And one of them eventually, at near the top of her form in her early 20s, just gave it all up. It, it was a little surprising. And people said, why did you do it? And she said, it isn't that chess was too much for me. It wasn't enough. She wanted a life. She wasn't willing to give her entire life to chess, which is what it was going to require for her to be the greatest in the world. And so she said, you know, it wasn't enough. She wanted a life. Well, that's fine. You know, uh, it's perfectly okay to want a life, you know, that, that's understandable. But be clear, don't think you're going to be the world's greatest, the Tom Brady of your sport or field or whatever it is, without giving as much as he gives. Absolutely. And there's, there's a few a few kind of follow-up questions I have on that. So where, where do you think some of these people get that drive? You know what I mean? Like, why? Well, why Why give up your entire life to be good at throwing a football? It's, it's not like he needs to do it for the money, not at this point. And I don't think that was ever really a driving factor. You know what I mean? And I don't think he's really into the fame or he doesn't seem like that kind of person, you know? You're, you're raising really, really deep questions here. Because where does it come from? 
But that's one of them. Where does it come from? Where does the passion come from? And to some extent, that is still a little bit of a mystery because the answer is probably deep inside somebody's head having to do maybe with childhood experiences or something. And so- Yeah, or even, or even goes into the realm of religion. You know what I mean? Who are we really? Are we, you know, what, what, what are at the core of our personality, the core of our being? What is that? Absolutely. Uh, there is one other um, insight on this that is worth thinking about, which is it doesn't appear that anybody really goes into an activity with this incredible passion to be great. A few seem to, but most people, including the ones who become the greatest performers, typically don't go into it with this incredible burning passion to give their life to something. Rather, the passion seems to develop, just like the ability itself develops with deliberate practice. So, uh, for example, there's a story in the book about Jerry Rice, greatest receiver in the history of football. In high school, he wasn't a passionate football player. In fact, uh, the coach had to go out and recruit him. He, he, this he was in a little town where he grew up. The coach had heard that this kid was fast. Well, receivers need to be fast. So he, you know, he went and recruited him onto the team. He didn't know he was going to be interested in football. But over time, the passion built. And so he was another one of those players who absolutely gave his life to football. And he did it for 20 years, which was in itself a near miracle because practically nobody lasts for 20 years in the NFL. Especially and in that no, position. At just exactly right. In, in the wide receiver position where defenders are going to try to crush you on every play, where you've got to run like heck on every play, nobody lasts 20. And nobody other than him ever has lasted 20 years in that position. He gave his life to it, but he, he didn't start out that way. And, you know, I've experienced a little bit of that myself. I mean, again, just coming back to my, my uh, now just <laughs> cliched golf story that in the beginning, I, when I like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to really like this, but I think you can develop passion through getting good at something because nobody's passionate about something you suck at. Nobody, you don't do something you're bad at, no matter how much it might seem interesting to you. Even if we, if we come to something ridiculous, like a video game, something that's engineered to just hook you and you have some of the smartest people in the world figuring out how to make you play more video games and click more Facebook ads, right? So you start off on a, on a video game that is set up in with actually a lot of this science uh, deliberately kind of baked into it to really get you in. But if you, in the beginning, you're not good, you go, you just, it's not like you feel good playing even a video game that you suck at. So, and that takes no effort. You're sitting there moving your thumbs. How much effort does that take versus playing wide receiver? So, you know, I think there's something to be said for if you have something that just kind of draws, it, it speaks to you in some way, if you feel a natural inclination towards something because it's uh, you've, something you've always kind of just thought was neat or you're always curious about. And, and maybe also it, it fits your personality to some degree or, or fits maybe, maybe you do have a little bit of a knack for it or not. I think that you can easily develop those things into passions by doing what you're saying, applying deliberate practice by getting good at it. And then you're like, hey, I'm good at this. And all of a sudden it becomes fun. Yes. And, and this is in fact typical um, in the development of great performers. For, for some tiny reason, they do well just maybe a little better than some of the other kids around them. They do a little better early in their development. So this attracts attention. That makes them feel good, right? Just getting some praise. They feel, they feel good. And so they try a little harder because they're liking this. And so then they get a little better. As they get a little better, they probably are going to attract more attention and better teachers. And more teaching time. Anybody that grew up playing sports, you saw that in, in some cases, maybe experienced it firsthand where the coach naturally starts putting more time into his better players. That's exactly right. So, of course, that makes them even better. And this becomes a, a virtuous circle, a self-reinforcing cycle where they get better, they get more attention, better teaching, uh, more reinforcement. They feel better about it. So then they get still better. And you can see how the passion develops, how they, they come eventually to love this activity 
even though they didn't start out that way. And you got to you got to figure that that can like I think of something like curling. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 proof enough of this, right? How do you, nobody nobody yeah. wakes up one day and like you know what I need to do? I need to push a metal thing on an on an on ice and <laughs> sweep the ice. That's just what I was made to do. Right. right. And yet, but people they are in the they become passionate. People are very passionate. They're the Olympics. Very passionate about it. So, what about the ten thousand hour rule? Because that's a thing, obviously. Yeah. Popularized Malcolm Gladwell outliers and has has obviously yeah. been well. There's been a lot. There's a lot been a lot of additional research and because that that to some people is kind of discouraging if they just understand right. it as it takes ten thousand hours to get really good at something. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm so glad you raised that issue because it does need to be discussed. So let let me state it very clearly right at the top. There is no 10,000-hour rule. It simply doesn't exist. Everybody talks about it because Malcolm Gladwell wrote a very successful and very enjoyable book called Outliers that included a chapter that was called the 10,000-hour rule. Now, he based that uh, initially on the research done by a guy named Anders Ericsson, who's a professor at Florida State, and who is absolutely the leading authority in the research on all of this stuff. All of this stuff I'm talking about, really the foundation for all of it comes from the research done by Anders Ericsson. He is the number one researcher here. And I'm a, I know him, and I'm a great admirer of his, and he is he is the guy who uh, is the, the, the founder of all of this stuff that we're talking about. The f- number happened to come from a very f- influential study that Anders Ericsson and some other researchers did long ago, uh, having to do with violinists uh, at an elite academy in Berlin. They found, among other things, that the very best violinists there, when they were 20 years old, had accumulated 10,000 hours of lifetime practice which was a lot more than some the, than the other violinists who were judged by their teachers to be not as good. And so that's where the 10,000-hour number came from. But as uh, Anders Ericsson has always pointed out, A, that was an average. Some of the people had practiced more than that. Some had practiced less. Two, this had to do with violinists at the age of 20. It didn't have to do with any other field of endeavor, and at any other time. He said, look, in the, in the world of being a violinist, that's apparently what you need to have at the age of 20 if you're going to go on to become one of the really good violinists who can make a living playing with a major orchestra or even become a, an international soloist. But he said, that's at age 20. Uh, those people don't stop practicing. And in fact, if they're going to become the future great soloists, they're going to rack up a whole lot more than 10,000 hours. On the other hand, in other fields of endeavor where there isn't so much international competition, you can become world-class great with much less deliberate practice than that. Uh, And he gave some examples there. So the idea that something magic happens at 10,000 hours is simply mistaken and also lost in the um, in the Malcolm Gladwell accounting is the idea that this is 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, not just 10,000 hours of activity, which is what most people seem to think. You know, they seem to think that if you just do something for 10,000 hours, then you'll become really, really good. No, not at all. They were measuring deliberate practice, which we've already defined. So, it, the, what I really would wish people would do is just erase that concept, erase that phrase from their minds. It doesn't help at all, and it doesn't describe a real phenomenon. And what would you say is a more realistic es- estimation of how much deliberate practice does it take to get very good at something? And of course, very good is kind of subjective in nature, but if we could somehow just objectively, you know, say we all can kind of agree probably on what very good means in anything, that can be quantified yeah. to something. Uh, well, it, it can, but a, a lot depends on exactly what uh, field we're talking about. And so I, my own belief, and I know it's Anders Ericsson's belief also, is that there is no number that can usefully be given. The only thing, the one thing that comes out of that 
popularization of the 10,000 hour idea, the one useful thing is the concept that it takes an awful lot of really hard work at a specific activity before you're going to become really, really good at it. And if, if that's all people take away from it, then that's a good thing because it does yeah, like, take a lot of a lot of that hard work. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, I think, you know, you could probably at least say a few hundred hours of deliberate practice in pretty much anything, unless the unless anything that has any amount of complexity is going to get you going. If you're getting into something with a, you know, it's just having the correct estimation of effort. If you, if you're getting into something that again, has any, has any level of complexity and competition, if you think that 50 hours off, I just practice 50 hours Eh, that's probably, yeah, I mean, you're not going to be, not going to be very good. <laughs> you're not going to be very good. And, and I'm glad you mentioned competition because one of the best ways to think about this is how much competition is there in whatever field you're talking about. If you're in a field that has intense, large scale international competition, then it's going to be really, really hard to become world class great. So look at the Olympians. Uh, International competition at the highest levels, you know, it takes a long time. They have all had to devote their lives to uh, getting to the Olympics. On the other hand, a very early study that was conducted by Anders Ericsson and another researcher um, looked at a very simple activity, simple to describe, which is remembering random digits that are read aloud to you. Okay, so this sounds stupid and really <laughs> basic. Somebody reads you a list of random digits and then stops. You have to wait 20 seconds and repeat the digits in order. And that's it. Okay. That, that's a competitive sport too. <laughs> I think they, they have All memory right. competitions. <laughs> they, they do now. <laughs> and it's in part, it's because of this experiment that Erickson and another guy did a long time ago. Because it, it turns out that it's really hard to do this. It, it, it's really hard to, to listen to uh, digits being re read out loud, then wait 20 seconds. That's what makes it really hard. And then repeat them in order. Most people, believe it or not, max out around nine digits. After that, they just can't get them in the correct order. So they were training an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon University, and they got him up past nine digits got up to 14 digits, which appeared to be the record at that time, even though nobody really was taking any of it very seriously. They got him up over 20 digits, which was very, very difficult for him, by just taking him through constant deliberate practice. When he finally stopped, they had him up to 82 digits. Wow. He could hear somebody repeat 80, you know, read 82 digits, wait 20 seconds, and he could repeat them in order. Now, they say that was clearly the best. There was nobody else in the world who could come anywhere near 82 digits, but that's because there was nobody else in the world doing this at all. Why on earth would anybody want to do it? That reminds me of the research, the memory research. I forget who it was, but it's the, you know, spaced repetition learning is based on that research. He just basically tortured himself with a metronome for years and years to figure out how, how quickly do you forget things, basically. <laughs> that's, that's tedium. It's tedium. So he became the world's greatest with a couple hundred hours of deliberate practice. Didn't take 10,000. But as you point out, they now have competitions at this event, which sounds to me like one of the worst things one could possibly. But anyway, that's what they do. And by the way, the record is no longer 82 digits. It's twice that, up to over 160 digits. But that's because there's now international competition. Yeah, and and just for people listening, I actually know a little bit about that. Like, if you want to, at least one of the one of the one of the great ways to do that is to use visualization because we remember images, and especially moving images, especially vivid images, a lot better than we remember things we hear or, or thoughts that we have. Um, so, if anybody at home, if you want to just have fun, what you can do is 
take a list of not necessarily numbers. You can just take a list of things. It's an easier way to do it. I've done this before and it's very easy to actually learn with a little bit of deliberate practice. You get it pretty quickly. So make a list of 10 random things. Just look around you. And what you need to do is <clears throat> when you're looking over the list, you need to create a little mental movie, a little movie in your head. So let's say I'm looking around. I just finished eating lunch. So I have a fork here. I have a wallet. I have a hat. I have a, I have a microphone. And so you need to create a mental movie that involves each of these items. And you want to make them a little bit larger than life, a little bit vivid. Maybe the fork is purple and on fire or something like that. And then if it goes from a wallet, let's say the wallet is after the fork, then the wallet falls on the fork and it explodes. And so you build this movie in your head that just moves from one item to another. And it doesn't, you, you can get good at it uh, fairly quickly to where you only need to go through it once. And then all you're doing now is replaying the movie in your head. So I go, oh, I see a fork. There's the fork. There's the wallet. And then you can you can mess with people if you get good at it because they don't know what you're doing where you go, yeah, give me a list of 10 things. You look over it, you have maybe 30 seconds and then you can give it forwards, backwards. You can give it at any point. You can Somebody could say, okay, go from the uh, go from the microphone up and then you just play the movie in reverse. You're just like, okay, the microphone, oh yeah. Then. So for people wondering how could you possibly remember so many digits. I think that's that's the primary method used, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. There are ways. Everybody has to have a structure of some kind to hang these things on, and then it becomes doable. So what you've just described is a great way because you can use that structure you've described with anything, right? Any group of objects or whatever that you want to remember, you can use that. For the guy who remembered the random digits, it turns out that he was a very serious runner. He was on the track team. And so when he would hear these digits, mentally, he would put them into groups that made sense as times. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a mile time, or, you know, there's a 10,000 meter time. And he could thus form ran apparently random digits into groups that he could remember because they had some meaning mm -hmm. to him. We all use a structure of some kind. Interesting. To do it. You know, I wanted to comment on something you mentioned earlier, which is just going back to that point of when, when you're, there's nothing wrong with looking at something, looking at a goal and then deciding that you are not willing to pay that price or, or pay what it costs. And, you know, I would say that that's probably to face that and be okay with that. And maybe mo you could change your goal. You can make your goal. You go, okay, fine. I, I'm not really ready, willing to give my life to this, to, to become the best, but I am willing to give 10 hours a week to it. And what could that get me? And, you know, it just makes me think of one, I, I, I just like that. And it's, it's a, something I've said on the podcast and written about, particularly in, in, in relation to work and making money, where not everybody needs to aspire to be a millionaire or, or, even, or a billionaire. And, and the billionaire is the version of that's the person who gave up unless he like, it's the guy who made Snapchat or something. But most of your self-made billionaires are people that they are the Tom Brady's of business. They gave their entire lives to it. And, and in many cases, their lives, they did very well at business and made a lot of money, but the rest of their lives were in shambles. You have broken marriages, you have broken homes, you have broken families, you have in many cases, broken people that are very good at, yes, they were very good at making money and they have a lot of nice things, but that's what you got to be willing to do. And, and I'd say if you walk that back to, you know, okay, if you want to be a millionaire, and again, it's not just some fluke thing. That there's there's a price to pay there. It's it, it's there's there's you know are you willing to work sixty seventy eighty hours a week for long periods on end and are you willing to do that with no guarantee of success and you you know you constantly are maybe kind of doubting yourself and just back to, to your point uh, I just agree that there's nothing wrong with looking at that objectively and honestly and saying. No, that's not for me. But what I could do is, you know, I can give 40 hours a week to hard work because I also want to be able to give time to my health. I want to be able to give time to my family, to my friends. I'm going to do as good as I can with the time that I'm allotting to work. And I, and I do actually think you can become, people can become millionaires working 40 hours a week. It makes it harder. It makes it harder, but it, it can be done. And, you know, so you have these, you have those quadrants, you have your health, you have your work, you have your family, you have your friends and you can't have them all. Right. So you, you gotta, you gotta balance. If you say, I want to go all in on work and pay everything that it, that I have to pay. Just know that some of those other areas are going to suffer. One of those quadrants are is probably just going to have to go completely black. And are you okay with that? And it's such an important point to make because that's reality. 
So face it, people have a propensity to fantasize about success. They, they believe that it can be quick and easy. And in fact, this goes back to really what we started with at the, at the very beginning, the idea of an inborn gift, something that you are just naturally good at. And people love that concept in part because they think, if only I could find my gift, if only I could identify the thing that I was born to do, then success will be fast and easy for me. And the reality is, it just isn't. And in fact, one thing that I've learned in all the research on this is that when you talk to the greatest performers, whether it's in athletics or anything else, you talk to the greatest performer, a lot of people will say to them, gosh, you're incredibly talented. And they're trying to be nice. They mean it as a compliment. And the people who hear it know that those folks are trying to be nice. And so they smile and say, thank you. But inside, a lot of them are resentful because they know they didn't get where they are because they were born talented. They know they got where they are because they gave their lives to it. And it wasn't easy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's people might as well be saying, oh, you're so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and this is, this is, a, this has been a great discussion and the book is talent uh, is overrated. I highly recommend it. And also, uh, Jeff, you have a new book out. I thought we might close on what that book's about because um, I actually just came across it when I was putting together, you know, what I wanted to ask you for this, for this talk. So tell us about your new book. A new edition of Talent is Overrated is just about to come out. In fact, it'll be oh, in the warehouses, I don't know, in a month or six weeks. But anyway, this spring, it will start to appear in um, bookstores. And it's been updated with new research. It addresses some of the issues that have arisen um, because so many people have become interested in this. So, you know, keep an eye out for it because it's and, and it's really nice looking and everything else. So a new edition of Talent is Overrated. In addition, uh, the, the newer book, uh, the new book is called <laughs> Humans Are Underrated. It's about uh, how you and I are going to earn a living and be economically valuable as technology does more and more stuff better than human beings can do it. Hmm, so how to not get replaced by robots. <laughs> it's not get replaced by robots. And, you know, there are some people who think robots are going to take over. And I, I don't dismiss that. Uh, robots are going to be extremely powerful more than we realize. But even in that environment, some people are going to do very, very well. And so this book is about how you're going to be one of those people, no matter what happens with technology. Mm, can you share with us uh, one little tidbit, like one little, what's, yeah. what's one area where you think we can really thrive? Cal, uh, Cal Newport spoke about this in his book, Deep Work. I liked, I like what he had to say about it. Yeah. The, the, the fundamental idea here is that our value will come increasingly from the skills of deep human interaction, our ability to interact with other human beings uh, in some deep way, which is a fundamental change from what has made us economically valuable through all of history up until now, because up until now, our value came from knowledge, what we could learn in school, skills that we could acquire in classrooms and things like that. And what we're moving to is a world in which technology does all of that stuff better than we can ever do it. And our value is going to come from the fact that we humans remain in charge of the overall system and our ability to deal with the other humans, to collaborate, to solve problems together creatively, to understand, to have empathy with one another discern what others are thinking and feeling and respond in an appropriate way. Those are not simple skills and we can learn them. And that's going to be the foundation of our value. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, it's a book I have on my 
to be read list, which is, which I will never, will never finish. I, 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 I now I work kind of on a rotation. So I read on different things and then books go move up in priority and down in priority. And I've accepted the fact that I will die with many books that are not going to get read, but this one was higher on my list because I find this kind of stuff interesting. So I'm sure I'll be getting to it this year. If I look at what I'm, I'm in the middle of Da Vinci biography right now and biography. Oh, is that great? Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. You know, I, I really like the biographies and Da Vinci is a great person to read about. But for some reason, and this is my second Isaacson or is it my third? So I, I enjoyed Benjamin Franklin. I guess just for me, Chernow has just ruined biographies. He's just so good that I have a hard time now reading other biographies. Um, and But but no, I am, I am enjoying it. And I, and I, I like to read them for uh, not just not just to be entertained, but, you know, I'm looking for ideas. I'm looking for, you know, things that I could, could take from it or th- how I might be able to model some part of myself after whoever it is I'm reading about. But anyways, my point is those are a uh, thousand page that you have to just work through them. But um, yeah, so I'm excited to read your new book. And again, Humans Are Underrated is the name of the book for everybody listening. I think that's it. Is there anything else? Did you have a website or would you like to, any, if people want to find you and the rest of your work? Yeah, very, very simple. Uh, it's just Jeff Colvin. Dot com, but I have to spell the Jeff because it's spelled G E O F F Colvin C O L V I N Jeff Colvin dot com. Perfect. Well, thanks again for taking the time, Jeff. Great discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure. Hey there, it's Mike again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it interesting and helpful. And if you did and don't mind doing me a favor, then please do give this video a like and leave a comment down below. Not only do I like to hear from everybody and I jump in and reply to as many comments as I can, it also helps other people find their way to the show and learn how to build their best bodies ever too. And of course, if you wanna be notified when the next episode goes live, then just subscribe to my channel and you won't miss out on any of the new content. Lastly, if you didn't like something about the show, then definitely shoot me an email at mike at musclelife.com and share your thoughts on how you think it could be better. I read everything myself and I'm always looking for constructive feedback, so please do reach out. Thanks again for listening to the episode and I hope to hear from you soon. And lastly, this episode is brought to you by me. Seriously though, I'm not big on promoting stuff that I don't personally use and believe in. So instead, I'm going to just quickly tell you about something of mine. Specifically, my 100% natural greens supplement, Genesis. Now, Genesis is a very unique combination of greens, superfoods, adaptogens, herbs, and other phytonutrients that have been proven to increase immunity, heart and circulatory health, energy levels, libido, mood, and more. Genesis is also naturally sweetened in flavors and contains no artificial food dyes, fillers, or other unnecessary junk. And all that is why it has over 200 reviews on Amazon with a four star average and another 150 plus on my website, also with a four star average. So if you wanna be healthier, feel better, train harder, and increase your immunity and longevity, then you wanna head over to www.legionathletics.com and pick up a bottle of Genesis today. And just to show how much I appreciate my podcast peeps, use the coupon code podcast at checkout and you will save 10% on your entire order. And lastly, you should also know that I have a very simple 100% money back guarantee that works like this. You either love my stuff or you get your money back period. You don't have to return the products. You don't have to fill out forms. You don't have to jump through any other hoops or go through any other shenanigans. So you really can't lose here. Head over to www.legionathletics.com now, place your order and see for yourself why my supplements have thousands of rave reviews all over the internet. And if for whatever reason, they're just not for you, contact us and we will give you a full refund on the spot.